Okay. Um, so I will talk today about, uh, I will continue talking about uh, catheterization techniques and I will focus on the right coronary artery, LV axis, and the idea of ventricularization. Okay. So I will show some right coronary cases from basic to advanced. First, um, this is the basic technique for engaging the right coronary artery, whether from a radial or from a femoral approach. And I will be talking uh, in general about techniques, including radial or femoral. If a technique specifically apply to one approach, I will be uh, indicating that, okay? So the way we engage the RCA from any approach is you try to get your catheter all the way to the right cusp then after you get it there, you pull and clock. It's a coordinated synchronous motion of pulling and clocking around 90 to 100 degree to 180 degree. You pull and clock till you point it to the right coronary artery in an LAO view that opens those ostia. This is how you have your hands here uh, for the first year fellows. You try to put one hand on the front of the catheter and one hand on the back of the catheter, and it's a coordinated motion. Both hands should be clocking, turning this way clockwise, and pulling. It's a coordinated clock and pull with both hands. You clock and you pull 90 to 180 degrees. Uh, you know, a common issue in first year is that they may clock with one hand while the other hand is preventing torque transmission. Uh, another uh, common mistake is that they clock more than they pull and you end up not transmitting your torque, especially if you have a sharp arch or a lot of tortuosity, your torque doesn't get transmitted. So make sure it's a coordinated motion of clock and pull. If you're clocking and pulling and you see the catheter come up here, meaning when you puff, you see a convexity, you know you're already too high because the coronary is at the top of the sinus of Valsalva. Once you see the convexity, that's the tubular aorta, you're already too high. You need to counterclock, push down and start over. This is an illustration of the difference between radial and femoral. Traditionally from a femoral approach using a standard JR4 catheter, you pull and clock and your catheter tends to dive once your clock is transmitted and the catheter is turning this way, it tends to dive down. So that's why the standard technique from a femoral is that you tend to keep pulling on the catheter to prevent it from diving. Conversely, from radial, you don't have that tendency to dive. It's easier to transmit your torque for a right coronary engagement and you tend to pull too much. So, the issue you tend to pull too much from radial, whereas you tend to not pull enough from femoral. So you have to adjust your pull depending where you're coming from, okay? And like I explained last time, for from a radial approach toward the left coronary, the catheters tends to, tend to be elongated and looking down, but for the right coronary, they tend to be loop shortened and looking upward when aiming to the right coronary, okay? This slide I showed it last time and it's a relevant slide. So what catheters do we use? So I mentioned the techniques we use, but what catheters should be used? The standard catheter for you diagnostic um, um, physicians is Judkins right and Amplatz right, Judkins right four and AR one or two. Those are the standard one. You can also use Tiger and Jackie from the radial approach. For interventions, those are my favorite. I don't like Judkins right and AR, you can use them. They provide very little support, especially from a radial axis, they tend to fly out. Those are the ones I like for interventions. Amplatz left one, which I mentioned, Amplatz left is used for the right coronary as well and from any approach, femoral or radial. And I also like Icari left, which I described in length last time, which is a good, left coronary catheter, but it's also can be a good right coronary catheter and it provides good support. There is also Icari right. So those are my favorite catheter. But for diagnostics, remember those, Judkins right, AR, Tiger, Jackie. 
description uh, again of the amplats right and left and the difference between them. So amplats is a catheter that has that duct shape, okay? The difference between amplats left and amplats right is amplats left has a big secondary curve, okay? Or what I call, it has a big butt. This is an amplats right. Amplats left will be like this here. It has that big secondary curve. When we say AR1 or AL1, 2, 3, we're talking about the distance between this and the tip. But regardless of one, two, three, the difference between amplats left and right is the size of this, okay? Uh, so in, in, uh, for the right coronary uh, engagement, amplats right one is a good catheter. However, uh, in some cases that I will show later, and if you want to mimic to a degree the amplats left without the difficulty of the amplats left, you may go for an amplats right two, which has a longer reach than amplats right one. Amplats right is easy to maneuver. It's you maneuver it kind of similarly to a Jutkins right. You pull and clock. Amplats left has a little bit of a more complex maneuvering, and I will describe this in a few cases coming. Okay. In general, also um, because of the their size, amplats right tends to point horizontal, or you can make it point downward, whereas amplats left with that big curve tends to point upward. We use amplats left one for the right coronary artery, amplats left two generally for the left coronary artery, and amplats right is only for the right coronary artery, and we use one or two usually. All right. This is an example of engaging the right coronary after having engaged the left coronary artery. Um, so here, this is a tiger catheter. We, so we pulled it out of the left coronary artery, then we pushed it back, so out, then we pushed it back down to the right coronary cusp. Then after we get it down to the right coronary cusp, then we can try, after getting it here, we pull and clock to engage the right coronary. So we pull out when you're using a single catheter, left and right coronary, we pull out. Then we push back down to the right coronary cusp. Then we, we pull and clock. This is an illustration of if you're pulling and clocking, once you puff and you see the convexity of the aorta, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, you're already too high. Once you see the convexity, you're already too high, okay? All right, this is uh, another illustration. I showed that in the past. Always understand your aortic anatomy as you're trying to engage any coronary. And the way you understand your aortic anatomy is by looking at the shape of your catheter. If your catheter is falling down like this, you know your right coronary artery is going to be on a horizontal portion of the aorta. If in this patient, as you're pulling your catheter is already at the vertical level of the aorta, you know you're already too high. So the understand your coronary, your aortic anatomy, and aim your catheter accordingly. In this patient, the right coronary artery will be uh, on a horizontal portion. In this patient, it will be on a vertical portion, and the catheter will show you. Imagine this patient with a lot, an older patient with a large and elongated aorta. Don't aim for the right coronary here. You know you will be too high. Aim for it here. The distance between the cusp and the right coronary hasn't changed in those two patients. It's just the, your impression will have changed between those two, okay? You might, you might falsely think it's here, whereas it's in fact still in this distance, which will be horizontal portion, okay? So, let me move to uh, you know, more interesting ideas. First question is, what is the most common reason of failure to engage the right? Meaning you, you did those maneuvers, you pulled and clocked, and you tried multiple times in the right coronary sinus of Valsalva, and you cannot engage it. You puff and you see nothing coming off here. What's the most common reason for that? Anybody can tell me? Somebody mentioned anomalous origin, but be more specific. 
what origin are we talking about? So you're puffing here and you don't see anything. You don't see the right coronary artery. You've tried three, four times already. Your catheter is not high. You're puffing across the coronary sinus of Valsalva. What's the most common? Where you should, should you aim for? Yes, correct. It's anterior origin of the right coronary artery. So the right coronary is not coming here anymore. It's coming here anteriorly. And I'll show you a picture. This is an axial cut across the uh, sinuses of, Val of Valsalva. So, and this is an LAO. So we show, we show you how the LAO looks and you have the left cusp and the right cusp, okay? So normally the right coronary arises from here and you make your JR4 or any catheter points in this direction. In an LAO view, your JR4 is pointing here. But there is a small, but not insignificant proportion of patients who have an anterior right coronary artery. It's still arising from the right coronary cusp, but it is anterior. Probably in the range of three, 4%, maybe 5% of patients have that to various degrees. So there are two problems with an anterior takeoff. One, when it's anterior takeoff, and you, again, you're doing LAO view, you have to make the, your catheter point toward you. So the catheter is no longer pointing in this direction. It should be pointing at you when it's anterior takeoff. In an LAO view, it should be pointing at you. So that's one caveat, okay? In this case, RAO actually will tend to be orthogonal to it. You will make your catheter aim toward that anterior portion of the aorta. So LAO stops being helpful, rather RAO will show you the catheter laid out in front of you. That's one. A second caveat is the JR4 and the AR1, the standard catheters used, and probably the tiger in most cases will not be able to reach it when it's anterior. So they will not be able to engage it. This is an illustration of Judkins' right catheter. When you clock it, it only reaches a, and touches the aorta when it's aiming toward the right side of the aorta. So you clock it, it elongates progressively and it touches the aorta when it's on this right side of the aorta. In the middle way, when you make it aim anteriorly, it's not elongated enough to reach that anterior aorta. You have to think of those catheter in 3D. They tend to elongate as in particular JR4 and AR1, they tend to elongate as they further clock. In the middle way, they are not touching the aorta. They are too short to touch an anterior aorta. Therefore, your Judkins right and AR and Tiger are not going to be able to engage that anterior aorta and the anterior takeoff of the RCA, okay? So two tips, RAO, and you need a different catheter, a catheter that can reach anteriorly. One will be an Amplatz left one, again, very helpful catheter in difficult cases, left or right. And another catheter will be AR2 instead of AR1. And I'll show you some cases. This is a nice illustration. This is an LAO view. We're trying to engage. And here you see, we knew the catheter is not on the right side of the aorta. So we aim the catheter more anteriorly. This is a Judkins right. And you can see where it is arising. You see where it's arising? It's arising from the anterior side of the aorta on a non-selective shot. So in this case, the next step is to go with an AR1, oh, sorry, with an AR2 or an Amplatz left one. And that's what we did. We were able to engage it with an AR2. And this is an RAO. So this was an LAO where normally the right coronary is here, but in this case, it's pointing at us. This is an RAO where the right coronary is arising from the anterior wall of the aorta. And I like RAO again, because it helps me lay out my catheter. I like to lay out my catheter, spread them out and be orthogonal to them as I'm working and maneuvering. Uh, the same when you're taking a picture of an artery, you like to be orthogonal to it to see it perfectly well. So anyway, to see the osteum here and aim for it, we did an RAO and used an AR2 and that worked well. 
Um, this is another case here, okay? Same thing, we're starting with a Judkins right? We could tell from failing that it's probably the RCA is anterior. And on non-selective shot, you see how that JR4 cannot reach. JR4 cannot reach when you're anterior. And that's what happened. So um, we got another catheter and we engage it. This is an LEO view. The catheter is pointing at us rather than point toward the right side of the aorta. And this catheter here again was AR2, and this is again an REO view of it. Okay. Uh, this is another case. This was done here by the fellow. So they tried to engage, and this case was recent. This is from last week. So they tried to engage the uh, right coronary, and they tried multiple times. They could not get anything. And this is a nice shot that helps. So you inject, you want to see, am I getting too high or too low? So get an unselective puff across the right side of the aorta. He got an unselective puff, and clearly, you know, you're seeing the right sinus of Valsalva, and here you see the tubular aorta. There is nothing on the right side of the aorta. So you know that the next step, it must be anterior, okay? That's the most common uh, scenario in this case. This was an AR1, so we decided to do RAO and use AL1, and that succeeded. Here we're maneuvering the catheter and we engage it. So we are using RAO, this is live, how are we engaging it? We pushed and engage. So in an RAO, we went to the right cusp, oh, sorry, in an LAO initially we start, we made our catheter go to the right cusp, then we switched to an LAO view and maneuver that amplat uh, left. We pushed it to give it the duck shape, aiming toward that anterior side of the aorta. Since again, on REO, we know it's coming from here and it engages successfully, okay? Um, any questions so far? No questions. Uh, I will go to the next case. This is another case, a little more difficult. This is a patient, uh, I showed that slide a little earlier. This is a patient with elongated aorta and actually dilated aorta. It's a 5.7 um, centimeter or 5.8 centimeter uh, aorta. Uh, so we expected the aorta to be low horizontally uh, on that aorta. Okay, we tried to aim for it, we couldn't get it. And this is a puff that shows us, okay, well, I'm caressing here the right side of the aorta. I cannot find it. So in this case, and it doesn't exist on a non-selective shot. So we knew it will be anterior and it's not unusual in those uh, very dilated aorta, the anatomy changes, the right coronary ostium get pulled anteriorly frequently in those enlarged aorta. So not unusual to require an amplatz and try to aim anteriorly in those patients. And that's what we did. We got an amplatz and it, it's anterior, but it's not just anterior, it's very high. So the amplatz left could not reach it. We got an amplatz left two and even an amplatz left two could not reach it. Here you can see, this is an audio view and you see how anterior it is and the catheter is barely able to reach it. Now, there is something else about this coronary I want to mention. Um, I want to show you here again, this is anterior and we reached it with an AL2. Uh, uh, let me show you the picture. Uh, the, there is another thing about this uh, right coronary. What do you think it is? Is it just anterior or is something else about it? Look at this view. When we say anterior, most often we mean it's anterior and coming from the right coronary cusp. But sometimes it's anterior and coming here from the left coronary cusp. And that is what this patient had. And the LEO view helped in that regard. You know, LEO spreads the right and left coronary cusp, but look where this is coming from. On the non-selective puff, you see here. 
This is the left coronary cusp. It's well delineated. Left coronary cusp, the right coronary cusp will be somewhere here, okay? Uh, another uh, concavity here. So this is a left coronary cusp. It's arising from it. So this is anterior left anomalous origin. So this is not just anterior, it's anterior and left coronary uh, cusp origin, okay? The REO doesn't help in this regard. It tells you it's anterior, but to tell right versus left, of course, as we know, that's why we use LAO in a standard fashion to engage because it sets apart right and left. And this is what tells you, this is not just anterior, it's anterior and left, okay? LAO tells you left, REO tells you anterior. Everybody understood that? Okay, uh, this is a, just an illustration in general of how to use the Amplatz catheter in general, okay? I described to you uh, its value in uh, engaging those anomalous right coronary, particularly the anterior right coronary, but I want to give you tips about how to use it. This is an Amplatz left one used to engage um, an anterior right coronary artery, okay? So first you get that tip of the catheter into the cusp of interest. So this is, we're aiming for the right coronary artery. It's anterior right coronary, but anterior right cusp, right coronary. So we get it into the right coronary cusp. We get the tip in the right coronary cusp. That's the first step. And we got it here. Then the next step, you want it to be free. So you pull a little bit to make it free over the right coronary cusp. Then you start pushing and clocking. You want to push to give it the duck shape. Then you clock to make it point toward the right coronary artery, whether on this surface of the aorta or more anteriorly on this part of the aorta. So this is LAO. The normal right coronary will be here. The anterior right coronary will be here. So here we got it to the cusp, we freed it. Then we start pushing while clocking. The push, now it's giving it the duck shape, the great duck shape that sits on the uh, aortic uh, cusps and the clock will get it to the right coronary artery. And here it got, it engaged the right coronary. Okay. Generally speaking, let me show you here. So, you push it and you clock, as I said, to give it the right, to, to give it the duck shape. Normally the tip, throughout those maneuvers, the tip of the catheter is in the cusp of interest, in this case, right coronary cusp, but the butt will typically sit on an opposite cusp. In this case, it was sitting on the non-coronary cusp. Sometimes it will be sitting on the left coronary cusp, okay? But focus on the tip and the rest will follow. Okay, everybody understood those maneuvers they are very important actually for interventional fellows, since this is an important catheter for interventions. Another important tip with this catheter is how to disengage it. Uh, imagine this catheter here, okay, it's sitting on the aorta. If you just pull it out, like we do with other catheters, if you just pull it, it will dive in. So. For, especially for new fellows. This is the catheter with the highest risk of dissection for that particular reason. You pull, it dives in. So you don't just pull this catheter frequently, you actually push it to pop it out of the coronary. And when it pops out, you torque it away, then you pull. So you often have to push to pop it out, then pull, uh, torque, then pull. But that's not always true, you know, it depends. If the catheter is sitting on the valve, then yes, pushing it will probably pop it out. But if the catheter is not sitting on the valve, sometimes just pulling it will work. The key here is to do it under fluoro and react to what you see. This is a case where we use the pushing technique to pop it out and it worked. So this is inside the right coronary now. We're pushing here, we're pushing. And now it popped out. You see how it popped out with further push? So it's on the right coronary and we kept pushing. And it popped out. And then after it pops out, we torque it and pull it out. 
if you're doing an intervention and you still have your gears and I tell fellows in general, I try to keep my wire and balloons in. So I disengage with my wires and balloon in. So if a mistake happens and the catheter dives in, at least we have the balloon to protect us from dissection. Okay. Did everybody understand those tips? Please ask questions. All right. Um, let me show you another case. So that is more advanced, this one. This is more for interventional fellows. So this is it. We have a right coronary artery. We tried with a JR4 on the right surface of the aorta. We could not engage it. We tried with an AL1 on the anterior surface of the aorta. We could not engage it. So now what's the next step? Where is this right coronary artery? Anybody can answer. So it's not on the right side of the aorta. It's not on the anterior surface of the aorta. We tried here. We tried here. Didn't work. Where is it then? Yes, now it's anomalous origin from the left coronary cusp. Yes, correct. Left anomalous origin from the left coronary cusp. Now, like I showed in a prior case, this was an anomalous origin for a left cusp, but it's kind of left anterior. You were maybe able to a degree to get it with, you, with your same amplats left. But sometimes, so this is the, the case I showed earlier was left and anterior. Well, sometimes it's not just left and anterior, it's left, deep left, what I call deep left. It's ne next to the left coronary ostium. In those cases, AL1, which you use for an anterior, is not going to work. In those cases, what catheter will work in those cases when it's deep left? You can imagine what catheter. What catheter would you use for a deep left? Yes, Judkins left. You would use the same catheter you use to engage the left coronary. You can also use amplats, but it will be an amplats left too. Again, the same amplats you would use for a left coronary. So this is a case I will show you. I had this case a few months ago. So we tried all those techniques initially. We couldn't get it. Then we imagined it, imagine it, must, it must be deep left coronary. So I went back with a Jutkins left. We had used a Jutkins left 3.5 to engage the left coronary artery. We went back with a Jutkins left 3.5. And here it is, it's a deep left, left coronary artery. It's not anterior left, it's deep left. This is the left cusp. Again, in the LAO, it's nice. Shows the left cusp and right cusp will be that concavity here. So this is left cusp and it's clearly coming from it on top of the left coronary artery, okay? So in that case, the next question, and that's an advanced question, what catheter would you use to engage it? What catheter for left cusp RCA? This is an advanced question. You will get this on interventional cardiology bo board. I actually had that question. So you need to know which catheter to use. So if it is, there are three options. The left, the right coronary could be this, deep left high, deep left low, or anterior left. So anterior left is easy. I mentioned it earlier. Here it's amplats left. It could be amplats left one or amplats left two. It's kind of a little similar to the anterior right. But those we use a Jutkins left. The question, what kind of Jutkins left would you use? If I use a JL4 to engage the right, the left coronary, what Jutkins left will I need for this? What Jutkins left will I need for that one? Uh, good answer, excellent answer. So in order to engage the up one, we get a shorter Jutkins left, Jutkins left three. And this is what we use in this case. To, in order to engage it, we got a Jutkins left three and we looped it up to look upward, okay? Now, what is interesting is that for B, it may seem intuitively you need a larger catheter to make it point down. But somehow, just because of the very tight space, a larger catheter often becomes cumbersome to use 
because it's very low, very close to the valve. You want a catheter that you can loop and squeeze and, and, and uh, uh, basically uh, loop torque on itself, bend on itself. You want a catheter that you're able to bend and maneuver in this tight space. So that's why often for B, you also need a JL3. So for both of them, you need a shorter Judkins left. In the uh, A configuration, you need a, sh a short Judkins left that you point upward. For B, you need a short Judkins left that you make point downward, okay? You make it point straight down. You don't bend it, bend it on itself, okay? Those are general rule. Always also do a non-selective puff to know whether it's high or low and you adjust your catheter accordingly. You got it? So that's what we did here. We use the Judkins left and we got nice pictures of that right coronary artery. Another question that uh, fellows like to uh, answer is, well, is this left coronary, is this uh, right coronary artery that's coming from the left, is it interarterial? Is it anterior, posterior? What kind of course does it have? I will hopefully give another talk on that, but I can already tell you. Can anybody tell me what course this has? Anterior, interarterial, or you need something else to be able to answer. That view doesn't help. Those are the three options. Anterior, let's say, interarterial, or that's not enough. We need another view. All right. So LAO, I'll answer it. LAO, this is how LAO looks like, okay? It's spreading, and maybe that view will help more here. LAO is spreading right and left. It doesn't show you anterior, posterior. So LAO will not be able to tell you. It tells you left, right. It doesn't tell you anterior and it doesn't tell you uh, posterior. So in order to tell the course, whether anomalous right coronary or anomalous left coronary, you always need an REO view. And you see that course. Importantly, REO view doesn't just show you the aorta, it shows you the PA. It spreads apart, not just the anterior, anterior posterior size of the aorta, it spreads apart aorta and PA. PA is here anterior and to the left of the aorta. So PA is here. RAO will spread apart PA and aorta. And it will show you where this artery is coursing. And this is here a better illustration. Okay, this is RAO and it will spread the aorta and PA apart. And then you'll be able to tell, is this artery coursing, taking a sharp turn? If the artery is taking a sharp turn in front of your catheter, then it's taking a sharp turn in between the aorta and PA. And it means it's interarterial. If rather it's making a loop before turning, then it's anterior to the aorta and PA. It's anterior to the PA. If it is going this way, then it's posterior. If it is this way and taking a sharp turn, it's interarterial. If it is this way, but having a loop, it's anterior to the aorta and PA. So this patient, I can tell where is, what is the, um, what's the course in this patient of the RCA? It's a clear now on ARIO. Again, LEO couldn't help. ARIO, anybody can answer? I know I answered it already. Just want to make sure everybody's paying attention. So this right coronary arising from the left cusp is interarterial or anterior? Yes, correct. It's interarterial. It has a sharp turn. Okay. All right. But no worry about it. His coronaries were normal. This is this guy was 60 years old. It's rarely a problem. Anomalous right in a 60 year old. He's more likely to die from something else than from this. Uh, all right. I'll develop those in another session. Now I will focus after talking about the right coronary artery. I will focus on how to access the left ventricle. Anybody has a question about the prior talk? Please feel free to answer or type them in the chat box. I know it's a lot of REO, LEO catheters, but uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. So in order to access the 
left ventricle. Yes, somebody asked me about Shepard Crook RCA. Shepard Crook RCA is an RCA that has a very steep superior takeoff. Uh, I don't have one in, in this presentation. But anyway, it's a very steep superior takeoff. It could be anterior or it could be arising from the right side of the aorta, but it's a very superior takeoff. A Shepard Crook right can be engaged for diagnostic purposes using a Jotkin's right or an AR even. But really, it's best engaged for diagnostic, but def definitely for interventions using an Amplatz left catheter. As I mentioned, Amplatz left is not just a supportive catheter, it's also a catheter that tends to point up. So it's a, a, a Shepard Crook RCA is best engaged with an Amplatz left one, typically. You do the same maneuvers I described with an Amplatz left, how to, how to engage an Amplatz left. Uh, here I showed it. You do the same maneuvers I described here, but uh, the idea is that the coronary is pointing way up. You, it's a usually a difficult intervention because it's uh, it's a sharp bend up, then a sharp bend down. Uh, but uh, just know which catheter to use. Does this answer answer your question? All right. Any other questions? All right, I will describe the LV, just some basics here. How to access the left ventricle using a standard catheter. Let's say your Judkins right or your Tiger that you use uh, to access the RCA. How do you access the left ventricle? With the, with the standard catheter, not a pigtail. So I mentioned earlier the standard maneuvering when you're maneuvering the Judkins right and the, the um, uh, or the tiger to engage the native coronaries. Okay, those are, this is how your hands are on the catheter. Now, in order to engage the ventricle, you engage the ventricle typically with a wire geared and directed by a catheter, but it's the wire that will go in. You try to put the wire in, then you track it over with a catheter. So the maneuvering is different. You're maneuvering with a wire in place. So the way we do it this time, looking at both hands, you put one hand on the back of the catheter and one hand on the wire. You don't have a hand here anymore. And you torque the catheter back and forth and you advance the wire. You torque the catheter in different direction. Each time you torque, you advance the wire, hoping it will fall in the left ventricle. It doesn't fall. You torque another direction and you advance the wire. You don't just torque, you can pull. You can torque, pull, give different orientation, and each time you advance the wire and try to see if it goes, okay? Sometimes you need to push, and this is the only case where you move that hand forward. But otherwise, your hands are in the back. Unlike here, your hands are in the back when you're trying to access the left ventricle with a wire and standard catheter, okay? That's how I do it. Another uh, tip here, you need to find the proper Catheter, the best catheter, sometimes we struggle, patient has absolutely no aortic stenosis, yet we cannot get into his left ventricle. One, it's sometimes poor understanding of the anatomy and not imagining well the proper cusps. Uh, you should always, as you're aiming to access the ventricle, try to be in an LAO view that sets apart, again, the left and right coronary cusp and aim in between them and try to be able to imagine them. And I'll show some cases and try to aim the wire in between. That's the first step. So to imagine those cusp and know where to aim the wire and catheter. Two, you need to get the catheter that aims properly. Sometimes you get a catheter that just stuck in the right cusp. And regards what you torque and how you advance your wire, you just keep getting stuck, advancing everything in the right cusp. You need to free itself, yourself, aim to the proper place. And if the catheter doesn't aim you, get a better catheter. Frequently, again, in difficult cases, amplats left tend to be the catheter that's most helpful. And you can aim it in different way. You can make it elongated or you can push it to make it aim up, depending where that hole is. You push it to aim up or you pull it, make it elongated, not a duck shape, to make it point straight. Amplats left, to me, is the best catheter to cross the uh, severe aortic stenosis. Okay? 
So imagine the cusp as you're doing this and remember the right cusp is low and the non-coronary cusp are low. Both the right and non-coronary cusp are low. So if your catheter is stuck low, you may need to pull it up to free it, okay? The left cusp is the highest. So you need to be able to imagine those things as you're wiring. And if it is difficult, just give a puff, try to delineate your cusps and know where to aim that, uh, you know, where to aim that wire. Basically take your wire out, take an unselective shot to help guide you like an aortic root shot with a little bit of contrast, five, five to eight cc's, then put back your wire and aim for that hole. This is an example. This is an LV access done by a fellow. Here we start, he started with the catheter in the right cusp, okay? And he's aiming to that hole from the right cusp. Again, in your mind, in an LEO view, always imagine those cusps. You have to practice in your brain, try to imagine those. And you can imagine them via touching. As you're maneuvering your catheter and touching, the catheter falls down and it touches something, you know this is the right cusp. And he tries to maneuver here from the right cusp. Initially, his wire went into the left cusp. Here, let me re replay it here. The first thing, the wire went to the left cusp, then the wire went to the right cusp. You know you're going to cross easily here because your wire is dancing left to right. It will at one point go in between. So started left, then now right. Then now he's torquing the catheter as he keeps re-advancing and, and eventually he crossed, okay? This is another case. Here he was also by a fellow. Here he was uh, stuck in the right cusp for the most part. Uh, no, sorry. And he was dancing between right, and left, eventually it fell in the left cusp. Okay. Did everybody understand those maneuver? Okay. Now I will mention pigtail. So let's say you want to get a left ventricular gram, you can use a pigtail catheter, which has multi holes, and it's a safe catheter and a good catheter for left ventricular gram. It tends to give less ectopy, it tends to be more stable, and it tends to give better pictures. Uh, simply because one, it's seated better, it's not poking at the wall, and two, it's less risky because it has multiple holes, so the pressure is not coming off one hole. So if you use a pigtail to engage, it's a little different. You don't need to have a wire coming out of the catheter, unlike here. You don't need to have a wire coming out of the catheter. In fact, I think when you have a wire coming off the pigtail, it makes it cumbersome. So you try to access the ventricle with the pigtail itself. I keep a wire in usually, not all the way out, but I keep it in the body to stiffen the catheter. But uh, I engage the ventricle with the pigtail. So I advance the pigtail, I feel my way. If I feel I'm in the right cusp, as is frequently the case, I pull it up to make it a jump over both the right and left. Then I push it to loop, hoping it's pushing and looping over both right and left. If it falls, great, but it most often falls as you're pulling. Then I pull sometimes with a slight torque, whether clock or counter, and I hope it will fall, okay? So the key mistake I see with this catheter is that people tend to loop in one cusp and they don't recognize it. They keep pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling where they are actually stuck in that cusp. Well, don't keep pushing and pulling in the same place. If you feel you're on the right cusp, just pull it a little bit, see it jump. Always that jump is always helpful in those abstract maneuvering. The jump tells you you're getting free of something. So pull it until you jump, you know you're probably off that right cusp, then push and loop. And as you're pulling back, you hope it will fall down. Okay, if it falls halfway down, you can push the wire. Now you push the wire and it will straighten the catheter and make it all the way in, okay? All right, so this is just a reminder. I engage the left ventricle with an LAO, again, to see those cusps. However, to take the pictures, the standard picture, the long axis view of the ventricle is an REO picture. And this is the picture that shows you well the apex and it shows you the catheter, whether it's well seated. If you have a lot of ectopy, that's the best view to, to look at. 
to move your catheter, know whether it's poking somewhere and move it and position it in the middle of the cavity. Especially if you're doing left ventricular gram or if you're having ectopy, you want that catheter to be somewhere here, not poking up or poking to the apex. You want it here and not stuck in the mitral apparatus. You want it in the center. LAO view, we take it at times, it gives you the short axis view of the ventricle, but this is a standard view. All right, this is for the left ventricle. It's a brief. I will talk about more interesting topic now, which is damping and ventricularization. Any questions so far about the prior topics? Okay, so here is the, I will uh, give some basic uh, ideas. This is a catheter engaging a coronary. Normally the catheter is not occlusive. Pressure uh, flow and uh, pressure is swirling around that catheter into the coronary so that the pressure that the, we get at that catheter tip is really the aortic pressure, is the coronary pressure, but it's also the aortic pressure. Now imagine that catheter into an artery that is exactly the same, same size of it or even smaller than it, at least the ostium of it. It could be diseased in ostium or it just could be the artery is very small or it could be spastic. Those are the three options, spastic, small, or diseased ostium. That catheter is basically occluding the artery. Then the pressure in that coronary artery drops to very low or near zero. And the pressure you measure through the tip of the catheter will be what we call a damped catheter. So this is a normal pressure you're getting through the catheter tip when you're engaged in a small artery. This, so this is, you are in the aorta here, you engage, you get that pressure because you're fully occluding that artery. Now, at times you're engaged and you're occluding that artery, but not fully. There is a still a small stream of blood coming around the catheter, okay? And giving you a little bit of pressure. And this is where you get ventricularization. So you jump from aortic pressure to ventricularized pressure. Normally when you engage, the pressure shouldn't change much. It should stay in aortic pressure, down sloping in diastole with dicrotic notch. But here, when we engage, we got this pressure tracing, what we call ventricularized. It's rectangular, up sloping in diastole and with an A wave, okay? Now there are various degrees of ventricularization. This is a subtle form. This is a blatant form, but this is a subtle form of ventricularization. I can tell it's ventricularized because it's sometimes horizontal in diastole with an A wave. You don't see diacritic notch here. You see a notch here, which is actually a subtle A wave, okay? So you're occlusive. Now, what explains ventricularization? I have two explanations of why ventricularization happens, meaning why an engaged coronary displays a ventricular pressure. The explanation that is simplest is that it's like doing pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. When you're occlusive of that artery, your catheter doesn't see the aortic pressure anymore. Anymore, It sees the pressure downstream and that coronary artery is ending into the LV microcirculation. So we end up seeing the LV pressure. That's why you see A wave, which is unusual, but you see them because you're seeing the LV pressure. Now it's not a perfect LV pressure because some aortic pressure keeps it swirling around. It's like doing again pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Okay, you wedge it, you see the LA pressure downstream. Okay. The important idea here is you should not inject when you're in a damped or ventricularized position. Those tell you you're occlusive. So you inject in those occlusive positions. What will happen? Several things. One, your dye will be hanging. Will, your dye will sit here and will not get cleared. Furthermore, your dye will not just hang in the coronary, will your dye will hang in the myocardium. Furthermore, the third step of that process is VFib. When your dye is hanging in the coronary, then myocardium, the third step will be ventricular fibrillation. Partly because of ischemia that is aggravated by eliminating blood and replacing it with contrast, partly because you chelate calcium, contrast chelates calcium and creates local hypocalcemia and VFib as a result, okay? So very important to not engage, you in, to not inject. You engage, you see this, 
You do not inject. You think of the next step. And here are cases to tell you what's the next step, okay? So this is a case. Uh, I will show you three cases with three different ideas to illustrate this concept. So first case, left coronary. We engage the left coronary in this patient. And as we engage, we got this tracing. Now, somebody who's not experienced may think, oh, we're in the ventricle. Our catheter fell in the ventricle. It looks perfectly like a ventricular tracing with an A wave and very high LVDP. But we knew that's not the case. Our catheter has jumped from the right coronary to the left coronary. So we immediately recognize this is a ventricularized left main engagement. So what's the next step here? Again, do not inject. But what do you do? How do you get your pictures? If you cannot inject and you keep damp, you keep getting this tracing every time you engage, well, how do you get your coronary? The key answer, anybody knows, by the way? Think about it. Anybody can answer it? Excellent answer. Not always easy to implement, but it's intermittent disengagement. Uh, I will answer your second point, smaller catheter is also a possibility. But the most important answer here is intermittent disengagement. But how do you disengage? Remember, this is a radial engagement in this case. You have to be to barely disengage. And so barely disengage in order for you to not be ventricularized, but to get good pictures. The best way of doing this is to actually do a slight torque, not just pull, especially in a radial case. If you pull, your catheter will fly out. So the best way of doing it is to just slight torque and with a slight pull, but mostly focus on the torque to get yourself out, okay? So you torque and with a slight pull, until you go from LV to aortic pressure, then you inject. And that's what we did in this case. So you want to be disengaged, but you want to be barely disengaged, barely non-selective. You cannot inject from here. You're not going to get good pictures. Remember, you need to get good pictures. The single most important thing when you do a coronary angiogram is get a good angiogram. This is a perfect case that illustrates this. We are barely disengaged. We are not ventricularized anymore. You see the catheter jumping in and out the cusp, that it was good enough to make us see the coronary well, to make us see the osseum. Now the osseum looks a little tight here, okay? This is an LAO cranial view, which is a very good view for the osteum, but I couldn't tell how tight it is. This is a more cranial view. This was more close to a straight LAO. This was more a cranial view. Those are the best views for the osteum, LAO straight, LAO cranial and sometimes a cranial, but we couldn't delineate it well. But again, look at the maneuvering of that catheter. This is how you want it to be. You, you try to keep maneuvering until you get something like this, barely disengaged, barely non-selective. If this catheter doesn't work because it has a very long tip, I would say a better thing to do here is to get a shorter tip catheter, okay? Possibly Jutkin's left three, uh, potentially, something that is less likely to jump out is an option. Another option, uh, as Tyler mentioned, is to get smaller caliber catheter, such as instead of six French, you can use five or four French. That works for the right coronary. It is concerning to me to use it in the left coronary because honestly, even a four French, when I think osteal left main, I just want to be out of it. I don't want to inject any disease left main, even if I'm not ventricularized. I just want to be out of it. Uh, I don't want to risk dissecting it. So the, the only uh, diagnostic case where you can kill a patient is when you have severe osteal left main. So my preference is to stay out of it, try to get good non-selective shot. If this catheter doesn't work to get good non-selective, get something else such as a short Jutkin's left, okay? Or, or sometimes a short amplatz that you make it, you push it AL1 and you make it aim somewhere here. It doesn't reach all the way up, it reaches a little below. So amplats left one instead of amplats left two, that may work. This particular patient who ended up doing IVUS with a non-selective disengaged guide, and look how tight that osseum of the left main is. 
super tight. This is a delineation of it, what I'm showing with my index here. Okay, very tight. And we measured it at 3.3 .3 millimeters square. And interestingly, this, uh, by the way, I hope everybody knows the cutoff, it's six millimeters square uh, to be severe. Six to 7.5 millimeters square can be significant in the right patient with significant symptoms. This is in this patient, the true left ventricle. It's very similar to the ventricularized engagement, uh, except, you know, it is the LVDP is a little lower. It is high, as is the case in most left main patients. They will get uh, global ischemia and high LVDP, but uh, it's not as high as when you are engaged. This one was a little bit of a mixed LV and some aortic contamination, but it's very similar. This is to show you that ventricularization. For those of you who can stay with me, I want to show two more cases to illustrate that ventricularization concept and how to deal with it. So I showed the first case, which was left coronary. I will show two cases of right coronary uh, and two different uh, um, situations, actually, with, with two different um, tr uh, treatment of it, okay? So one, we engage the right coronary here. This was, uh, let's say, Judkins right four. We engage the right coronary. No puffs are given. We see this tracing. This is not ventricularized. This is worse. This is damped, the pressure tracing. So what is the next step here? One, you have to think, why is it damped? And two, what's the next step? When you see this catheter like this, no puffs, what is, why is it damped? Maybe one of the second years. Excellent answer, conus branch. So just by looking at it um, with no contrast, radiographically, the catheter is pointing up. Whenever the right coronary catheter is pointing up with this pressure tracing, you know you're in the conus, okay? The conus is a branch that come off the RCA or sometimes separate from the RCA. 30% of the time is a little separate from the RCA, but it's pointing upward and it's more anterior than the right coronary. The right coronary is more posterior and more downward. So when it's pointing up, you know you're in the conus branch. That's good. That's a better situation than, than the situation I showed earlier where you are actually in the true uh, coronary artery and you're damped. So in the conus, the conus also is a small branch. So you damp when you're in it because it's small. Doesn't mean you have disease, it's just a small. So what's the next step? You know you're in the conus, what do you do next to fix that situation? Any, uh, yes. So Ahmed answer, more clocking. So here you have to imagine, you have to think, is this catheter, is, is it too deep in the conus or is it barely in? And again, you have to rely on your impression here. It's a bit subjective. If you think you're barely in that conus, you can just keep clocking. Remember, the RCA is more posterior. So you keep clocking and you fall more posteriorly into the right coronary artery, okay? Now, if the catheter tip is too deep in the conus, and sometimes you can tell by the way it is pointing, it's pointing too much up. And I think in this particular case, it's probably too deep. So if you feel it's too deep in the coronary, in, in the conus, you don't want to keep clocking, you will rip off that conus. In this case, the best thing to do is to try to actually counter clock to get out, okay, to disengage, then, you try over, you counter clock, you get back to the aortic cusp, then you pull and clock. And this time you try to elongate, you kind of pull more on the catheter to elongate it so that when it engages, it's pointing more downward. That's a difficult maneuver. You need to be experienced to do that. I think for most fellows, it may be hard to do, to clock while pulling on the catheter to make it point down. The problem when you pull on the catheter, it may jump all the way up. As I said in radial, you anyway tend to pull too much. So it's not easy for fellows to do that maneuver. So I suggest for fellows to try A, keep clocking and see if it goes posteriorly in the right coronary artery, and it would do so if you're not too deep. If that doesn't work, you can try B if you're good. Otherwise, try C. Just get a catheter that points more down in a 
a radial, I'm using a tiger pointing up. I just change to JR4 that points more down. If I'm using a JR4 and it's pointing up, I get an AR1, which tends to point down. As I mentioned, AR tends to point down, AL tends to point up. Okay, so that's the, this is how we fix that situation. Everybody understood that situation, that first RCA situation. Any question regarding that? I'll show you the second RCA situation and how to handle it. Okay, this is the second RCA situation. Now, again, we're engaging here with a Judkins right catheter. This is the aortic pressure. As we engaged and we see the catheter here, we got this pressure tracing. So it's also worse than ventricular rise. It's really damped. So why are we damped here? What's the answer? Are we in the conus branch or otherwise, why are we damped here? So this situation, I want you to know here that when you see it like this, it, the catheter is not pointing up. If I see damping in the right coronary and the catheter is not pointing up, I know it's trouble because I know it's the RCA itself that is damping. And the first thing you should think of is that either the RCA is very small, it's a three options. RCA is very small, not disease, but very small. It is severely diseased osteally or spastic. Those are the three options. So the immediate next step is to disengage here and give nitroglycerin. That's the immediate next step. Disengage, get out, give nitroglycerin, and try again. Yes, excellent. Nitro now, it may be hard to give nitroglycerin IC intracoronary because you want to disengage. You don't want to maneuver in that artery with that damping. You can give it after you disengage. It will be basically systemic nitroglycerin, or you can give it sublingually. Okay? So you give nitro and you try again. Now, when you try again, it's, you have to do it differently. Probably don't try the same catheter. You have to try what can help you? What kind of catheter will help you when you get that situation? So you give nitro, what catheter? Let's say this is a six French JR4. What catheter will I use to help prevent that? So you want to use a catheter that is two ideas. One, if you can get here, it will help to get a smaller catheter, like a four French instead of six French. I'm worried about doing those in the left main. I don't like to maneuver in the left main. But on the right coronary, if it is diseased or small, I'm okay if I can get a smaller catheter and not get ventricularized or damp. So yes, try to get a four French and try to get a catheter that has less propensity to dive deep in such a way that you can make it slightly disengaged. So try to get a catheter with less deep engagement that you can put barely in, like we did here with the left coronary. Try to get a catheter that you can where where uh, that can be barely in, uh, barely engaged and barely non-selective. Okay, sorry, barely disengaged and barely non-selective. Okay, so if you're using a tiger, get a JR4. If you're using JR4, you might try to get an AR and keep it barely non-selective. Okay. And uh, that's what we did in this case. We gave nitro and we uh, used, in this case, actually that, that was a tiger. So we switched to a JR4 and the four French catheter. And we were able to obtain your, your images, okay? We actually switched to a JR4 here and we were barely non-selective. And we were able to obtain our images. We were not them. This is how the, catheter, the pressure was when we were taking those pictures. So we got another catheter that was not deeply engaged, was barely non-selective, and we got good pictures. See how well we're feeling the cusp, we're non-selective here, okay? Again, you could have got also a four French to make it even safer. So those are the three tips. Try to counter clock to barely disengage, improve the pressure and be close enough to the osteum. That's not gonna work with a catheter that has a very long tip. If the catheter is long, Try to switch to a shorter tip catheter, such as JR4, 3DRC, or, or maybe AR1. 
uh, that is barely disengaged and a smaller catheter. If none of those works, you're still damped despite all those maneuverings. And again, nitroglycerin. If none of this work, then you do the last shot, which is hit and run. But before I show you the hit, this is the hit and run. I'll show you the hit and run. The hit and run basically while you're damped, and again, it's last shot technique. While you're damped, you inject and you pull out. You inject one to two CC and you pull out. So you never get coronary stain or myocardial stain. And you inject it gently. Okay, you don't want to dissect that damped artery. This is another case where the tiger was deep in. We were slightly ventricularized. Look again, slightly horizontal pressure. Uh, you change from a downsloping pressure in diastole to a horizontal pressure in diastole. Still, we did not want to engage. So we switched from a six French tiger to a four French GR4, and we were able to engage with and uh, inject with no damping. We, we also tried two things here. We also got a six French GR4 short tip that was disengaged and we were able to get picture with a six French short tip GR4. That, so that case shows you the illustration of two techniques four French and short tip catheter, okay? Did everybody understand that? And this slide summarizes it. With the right coronary artery, two situation, you're damped or ventricularized with a catheter tip point up, you're in the corners, this is how you handle it. The catheter tip is pointing horizontally or down, you're in RCA that is narrow, small, or vasospastic. This is how you handle it. Okay, you react to how your catheter looks. Now, any questions? I'm almost done. I mean, you, you can leave. I can mention this quickly. Uh, I, I think I have to mention the side hole. It's a question that comes up. Side hole catheter, for those who can stay for two minutes, side hole catheter is a catheter that has holes beside the tip. When you're damped or ventricularized, those side holes will allow shunting of blood from the aorta and the coronary. So they will provide some flow to the coronary. There are caveats to this side hole. So in theory, it may prove useful. It may, you may think it's useful because it's preventing ischemia. It does definitely prevent contrast stain to a degree at least. I do want to focus on the caveat of this side hole catheters, okay? First caveat is that they, those tiny holes provide marginal flow to the coronary, few percentage of flow, and does not significantly or markedly attenuate ischemia. So you will still be ischemic. Two, it makes ventricularization and damping improve, not because you're improving ischemia in the coronary and flow in the coronary, but partly because you're getting transmission from those side holes. So you're getting a contaminated pressure. So you're not just seeing pressure at the tip, coronary pressure, you're seeing aortic pressure. So it gives you false reassurance, which I absolutely hate. It's a false sense of security. Third problem with the side hole catheter is that they have no role in diagnostic catheters because in diagnostic uh, procedure, you're just sitting briefly. The best thing, uh, you, you, you know, you're just doing quick injections. It may have values in cases where your catheter is sitting for a prolonged period of time, such as during intervention for a prolonged period of time between injections, not just doing injections. So this is where you may use it in interventions. Don't use it in diagnostic. But even in interventions, keep in mind the caveat I just described, and keep in mind the fourth and last caveat here, which is you should never, for interventional fellows, never, never use side hole catheter in left main intervention, okay? You do not want to have left main ischemia for any period. And you definitely don't want to mask left main ischemia with side holes. In left main osteal disease or small left main that is damping, just you have to intervene with a slight disengagement. It's painful, but that's how you do it. Slight disengagement. And you get your support via having one or two wires to grab that guide from outside the aorta without it flying out and without you being engaged. So be disengaged, couple of wires, and um, do not use side holes, okay, uh, to, in, in left main. You can use side holes in mid to distal RCA intervention with moderate osteal disease, simply because I can afford to have a false sense of security in RCA intervention. I can afford having RCA ischemia in a patient who already has RCA disease. But left main ischemia, the patient will have PEA arrest 
by the end of the case, if you're using side holes and not paying attention that the side holes are fooling you. Okay, so don't use it. In RCA, again, I use it in mid to distal RCA intervention. I don't use it in osseal RCA simply because in osseal RCA, I have to anyway during my maneuvering, keep the guide in and out. Okay, I have to keep engaging and disengaging throughout my stenting and ballooning. So no point of using a side hole. Actually, I like ventricularization and osseal interventions because it tells me when I'm in and it tells me when I'm out without having to use contrast. Those are the four caveats. This is a summary slides of whatever I just uh, described. Uh, I'll let you read it when you review this. I'm done here. Any questions? Anybody has any questions? Yes, Vikram. Uh, Dr. Hanna, you mentioned um, the hand maneuvering was a bit different. Uh, with the when we're doing the ventriculogram, like engaging that compared to the other catheters, would you mind quickly going over that? Yes. What I meant to say, normally when you're engaging a let's say a right coronary, uh, you don't have a wire in place. You have your catheter and it's connected to the manifold, right? And you're clocking and pulling to engage the right coronary using both hands. Okay, both hands are clocking and pulling the catheter. You have no wire. You have your manifold, you can give puffs throughout your maneuvering. When you're engaging the left ventricle, we're not, con the way I do it at least, when I'm engaging it with a standard catheter, I don't have a manifold connected. I put a wire through the catheter because I want to get into the LV using the wire. So I use the catheter to point me toward the hole between the cusp, and I use the wire to slip it through those holes. So the catheter torques me and points me toward the hole. Then I advance the wire to slip through those holes. I don't try to push the catheter. It's usually hard. You try to push the catheter, it's not going to go through the hole. It will tend to fall into one of the cusps. So I advance the wire and I let the catheter track over it once I get into the ventricle. So the catheter torques, points the wire. Once the wire falls in the ventricle, I advance it to the ventricle. Then I hold the wire and I advance the catheter over the wire into the ventricle. Did you understand that? Yeah, I got that, thanks. And so with your hand maneuvers, you're clocking and counter clocking with this hand and you're advancing the wire. So you torque the catheter and you advance the wire with this hand. You torque, you advance. If the wire doesn't go in, you pull it out, you torque again, you advance. You pull it out, torque again, and re-advance until you get in, okay? Every now and then you need to move that hand forward to torque it, to, to, to not sorry, to torque, to push it in if you're already too far out, okay? So you pull and torque from here, but when you need to push that catheter, you put your hand in the front, okay? The key in those maneuvering is to imagine where you are. The most common mistake is that you're stuck in a cusp and you keep advancing your wire and your catheter, pulling and pushing it in that cusp. You need to get it free, get it out of the cusp, as is in this case. It is on the right cusp, but it's free of it. It's above it. And the wire is pointing nicely because it was in the left cusp initially, then it jumped in the right cusp. You see, it was in the left cusp here. Here, you see, it jumped in the left cusp. Then it jumped in the right cusp. You know you're free. You know, you just need to aim it to the proper area. The common mistake I see is that you keep pushing and pulling and jumping into one cusp. So as you're doing those maneuver, you have to see that wire and catheter jumping. It's key in all those maneuverings to see that if you know you're in the right cusp at various points, to see the jump. The jump tells you you're getting free of that right cusp. And when you're getting free of it, you know you're getting close to jumping into the LV. Okay, you jumped on the left coronary, but at one point you will jump in the LV. You're jumping around it. You got me? That's perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Hannah. All right. Any other questions? <laughs>